Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson certainly had right-wing friends and right-wing sympathies. This wasn't unusual amongst the British upper classes in the 1930s. But I I have to say that Edward, in, in my view, had a particular affection for Hitler. Welcome to episode five of The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession, with me, Jonathan Locke. We've been investigating five centuries of scandal, intrigue and cover-up in Britain's royal family. There's always been this problem of trying to basically shape the narrative and and try and hide the embarrassing stories. And particularly if you're being naughty, you know, going into the darker aspects or the shadow aspects of life. The, The whole point of this time is that all of the shadow is coming for public display. So as we're seeing, heads will roll. Now, we're turning to the monarch who many believe to be Britain's worst ever king. A man who was willing to betray his people at their greatest hour of need and hand control of the nation to Adolf Hitler. He was a fluent German speaker. He was sixth, seventh German. His mother was a German princess. He had lots of German cousins who were involved with the Nazis at quite high levels. So he was very sympathetic to the Nazis. And the rumor is that Hitler had it planned because he was a sympathizer, because frankly, he was an idiot. They were all on the same side. This was the scandal that they tried to cover up when this became apparent. Edward VIII also has the distinction of being Britain's shortest reigning king since the year 1066. He lasted just 10 months and 21 days on the throne and remains the only British monarch ever to have voluntarily abdicated. The reason he gave up the crown? According to Edward himself, it was love. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And for many years after, the narrative of Edward and Mrs. Simpson, the divorced American woman for whom he relinquished the throne, as a kind of epic love story, did hold some traction. I think there's absolutely no doubt, and I think every source agrees with us. He was absolutely besotted with her. With Wallace Simpson, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that he was head over heels and obsessed with her. But their story is a love story. They did stay together. And the one thing he wouldn't compromise on was her. So if it meant abdication, that was that. But how accurate was that narrative, really? I mean, she blackmailed her emotionally into marrying him by saying he'd kill herself if she didn't marry him. I do think at times that he did regret the decisions that he did make to stay on with Wallace because it did cost him his life. It cost him his kingship. This is not the great love story. It's a rather sad story of two rather pathetic individuals being forced to spend their time together because events overtook them. Was the abdication of Edward VIII actually about love at all? Was it even voluntary? Or was someone else pulling the strings, forcing even the King of England to do what was right for the firm? But uh, it is extraordinary. George V basically authorised the intelligence services to bug his son. Certainly, we think it's the first example of MI5 spying on the royal family. George V is on record as saying that boy will ruin himself within a year. I mean, he was very concerned about him becoming king, and there was hopes that he would kill himself steeplechasing and not actually become king. So in some ways, Wallace was a very convenient device to, to get him away from the throne. Edward VIII was born June 23rd, 1894 during the last years of his great-grandmother Queen Victoria's reign and was made Prince of Wales on his 16th birthday, shortly after his father, George V, became king. His childhood was typically reserved, raised under the care of nannies and private tutors. Royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams explains that although his parents could be affectionate, Edward's early years may have had a psychological effect on the prince. Well, as far as his father was concerned, uh, he had a fierce temper and we know that the um, children had a, a nanny who was a sadist. 
So, uh, for example, where they'd appear at a certain time before their parents and the nanny would pinch them so they'd be crying and the audiences, which is what they were, miniature audiences, everything was so formal with um, George V and Queen Mary, it wouldn't last long, so uh, until this was discovered, I mean, it was horrible. And I don't think that, I mean, mentally, he very possibly wasn't developed or normal, the word normal is odd in this case, because I'd say mentally, I, I think he, there was some part of him that was backward. After spending his late teens in the Royal Navy, Edward had joined the Grenadier Guards shortly before the First World War broke out. But his position as heir to the throne meant active service was out of the question. Jacqueline Roth, executive editor of TheRoyalObserver.com, explains how, despite this, the prince was keen to get involved as much as he could. He was definitely eager to fight for his country, and actually visited the trenches on the front lines several times, although obviously not in any seriously dangerous positions. But this willingness to get stuck in did make him popular with the veterans of that war for a while. And it has to be said that he was also very dashing, very good looking, so things actually looked pretty good for the monarchy. According to Thomas May Sarcher Mills, founder of the British Monarchist Society, whose adopted grandfather was also a Grenadier Guard charged with protecting the current Queen, this popularity may have gone to Edward's head. People liked him. They related to him. He was stylish, he was young, he was handsome. He was a ladies' man, he was a man's man. Everybody liked him, so he thought he could get away with whatever he could get away with. For Edward, this combination of popularity and entitlement manifested itself most obviously in a series of scandalous love affairs. He was known from the beginning as a womanizer. He had women all over him. He would go from one to the other to the other. He was a playboy prince, but he was actually the first global celebrity royal that we know in the modern age. Edward was definitely a playboy, but his real thing was for married women. One of the prince's married mistresses was Lady Thelma Furness, the American wife of British aristocrat Marmaduke Furness, at the time one of the richest men in the world. In 1931, it was Lady Furness who would introduce Edward to her friend, Wallace Simpson, a twice-married American socialite who was in the process of divorcing her second husband. Well, it's really interesting because when we look at Wallace Simpson, she never should have been where she was. but. Wallace was not conventional. She was someone who liked being in high society. She was used to this, but she was one that used her blunt Americanness to actually climb the social ladder in the United Kingdom. And it was only through her good friend who was linked to the Prince of Wales that said, look, I'm taking a little bit of a holiday. I don't want the Prince of Wales to be left alone. Why don't you have him round for tea? Why don't you do some things in my place until I get back? Those things soon developed into a fully blown, passionate love affair. So the introduction of Wallace Simpson into society and the royal family was the fault of her friend. And once Wallace got her hooks into the Prince of Wales, he was enamored with her. She was able to say and do things that no other lady of society would be allowed to do. And that's what captivated him. And he allowed her into his inner sanctum, which not many people were allowed to be. And people were openly hostile. You know, don't touch our king, get your hands off of him. He belongs to us, not you. And that's when they really started to pin the blame on Wallace. And I think very unfairly so. And then the xenophobia came in that she wasn't aristocracy. She wasn't a princess. She was a twice divorced American. And it wasn't until after the divorced part was stated that the American part came in because why not add insult to injury? Because the upper sets really said, well, you know, you're just a common American. What would you know? You can't be the queen. Which I find kind of interesting because 
just a generation before Americans were marrying into the British aristocracy left and right for titles for pay. If The Prince's affair with Wallace Simpson was scandalous, the real issue wasn't that she was American or unconventional, but that she was divorced. Here's Sally Otnes, author of Royal Fever, The British Monarchy in Consumer Culture. So Edward VIII fell in love with an American divorcee named Wallace Simpson. And until recently, royals were not allowed to marry people who had been divorced because divorce was forbidden in the Church of England, of which the Queen is the head. When you are the future king and you are the defender of the faith and head of the Church of England, you have no business with a twice divorced woman. It wasn't so much that she was brash and American, it was the twice divorced. But what was it about Wallace Simpson, the brash American divorcee disliked by just about everyone else, that so captivated the future king? She would do things for him that others wouldn't, but also she treated him the way he had never been treated before. She was mothering to him and he needed a mother. He didn't really have much to say about his parents. He was never really with his parents very much. He needed a strong woman to take control and sort of that would spill over into his bedroom sex life. And he liked to be treated and used in that way by women, especially strong women. And Wallace was a strong woman. There are many witnesses to this in, in books and in articles, the way that she often used to humiliate him. I mean, treated him like uh, a child in, in some respects. So it's a very odd relationship. She told him how it was going to be. She told him how it needs to be. And he liked that. He liked sometimes to be a little bit humiliated. He liked to be called out on things. He, he was very different in that aspect. Very often, she would apparently humiliate him in front of others. It was simply the way she, as I understand, the way she talked to him, the way he fawned on her. I mean, people pay a lot of money to be treated like that at certain clubs during the evening, but he was getting it for free. <laughs> so what one woman won't do, another one will do. And that's what he was looking for. It's why he would always go from woman to woman to woman. But Wallace just had this capture over him because she was the one who would do what the other woman wouldn't. On January 20th, 1936, King George V died, and Edward ascended to the throne as King Edward VIII. But as it became increasingly clear that he had not only no intention of ending his relationship with Simpson, but that he actually intended to marry her, what had begun as an embarrassment for the firm blew up into a full-blown constitutional crisis. The law was very clear. The king simply could not marry a divorcee. That's just the way it was. And this is the 1930s. It's not the time of Henry VIII. It was no longer a case that the King of England can just do what he wants and marry who he wants and cut the heads off anyone who disagrees with him. He had to obey the law. So he was basically told, you have to choose. It's her or the crown. I mean, it got to a stage where once it became a call celeb in Britain, the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, I remember the strength of the church, twice divorced American was absolutely out of the question at that time. And so they told him, you can't marry her and stay king. So he said, fine, I'm going to step down. So Edward VIII does this national broadcast where he says, I can't be king anymore because I can't be married to the woman I would love and be king. On December 11th, 1936, after less than a year on the throne, Edward VIII addressed a stunned nation on BBC Radio. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. If it was a historic and astonishing seven minutes for the people of Britain, it was also something of a masterclass in what we would now call spin. 
As we heard at the beginning of the episode, in that broadcast, Edward attributed his decision to his need to be with the woman he loved, a love so overwhelming he was willing to give up the throne for it. And I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine and mine alone. This was a thing I had to judge entirely for myself. So he and Wallace Simpson moved to France and lived in exile in France and lost all their rights in terms of being in, in the line of succession. That was the line the public were fed, the great love story, the man who gave up the crown for love. With Edward's brother, George VI, father of Queen Elizabeth II, now king, Edward and Wallace Simpson were given the titles of Duke and Duchess of Windsor and left Britain altogether, settling in France. But as royal biographer and author of Traitor King, the scandalous exile of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Andrew Loney explains, the love story narrative was not exactly the whole truth. The abdication, of course, has always been presented as the, the king being forced to choose between the throne and his love of Wallace. The reality, actually, is that he was maneuvered out of being king because he was totally unsuitable. He was actually pro-Nazi and there was no way that they were the authorities, that the, the men in the white coats or whatever behind the scenes were going to allow that. And Wallace was the pretext to, to basically push him out. Whatever Edward may have felt about Wallace Simpson, the real constitutional crisis lay in his and Simpson's links with Adolf Hitler's increasingly powerful fascist Nazi party in Germany. As Hitler began to flex his muscles, British intelligence services even took the extraordinary step of spying on the king before his abdication. Here's Andrew Loney and intelligence expert Richard Aldrich, author of The Secret Royals. Well, it's the first time, and we think the only time, the member of the royal family has been bugged. But uh, it is extraordinary. We know that, for example, his police protection officers were reporting back to Scotland Yard on him from about 1933-34. Certainly, we think it's the first example of MI5 spying on the royal family. But it's not just the British, because, of course, during the abdication crisis, Wallace Simpson goes to France. She's phoning Edward back in, in London every day. And the French intelligence service is also listening in. So we have this remarkable situation during the last month of the abdication crisis where one of the servants in Buckingham Palace who helps to run the telephone exchange moves a camp bed into the telephone exchange and sleeps there day and night with a thermos flask and sandwiches to try and prevent the staff in Buckingham Palace from earwigging in on Edward's telephone conversations. But just down the road, MI5 are tapping in and across the channel, the French intelligence service is tapping in. Amongst the government's concerns was Simpson's relationship with the Nazi ambassador to the UK, Joachim von Ribbentrop. Well, the rumours that she had an affair with the German ambassador Ribbentrop and that she received 17 incarnations a day to mark the number of times they slept together. It's very difficult to establish the truth of that, but they were certainly very close. Ribbentrop was sent to London to basically work on her because she was also pro-German and because they thought the easiest way to, to influence the, the king was through Wallace. So in fact, a German agent called Stephanie von Hollenhauer actually moved into an apartment next to her in central London. And we know by all accounts that Wallace was linked to a Nazi officer and he used to send her flowers, a rose for every time that they met and, and did the deed. And he would send Wallace these flowers, this Nazi officer. They were subject to a lot of pressure by the Germans to change policy. So, for example, to try and downplay the impact of the remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936. They were involved in trying to change to the Anglo-German Navy Agreement of 1935. So things that the, that the king should not be involved in, he was trying to interfere in, and generally in a very pro-German way. Andrew Loney believes that if Wallace Simpson was attracted to the Nazis partly for her sexual gratification, then Edward's fascist sympathies were similarly vain. Yes, the two elements. I mean, there was a personal revolt and, and in a sense, a political revolt. And the personal revolt was that he 
had had a very unhappy childhood. His parents were very distant and very cold. His father was a bully. He actually um, was a very abject figure. I mean, part of the attraction of Wallace was that she was very dominant and bossed him around and actually was pretty unpleasant to him and he liked that. And so, in a sense, joining up with the Nazis was a way of bigging himself up, particularly in her eyes. It was a way of feeling that he was doing something, having basically abandoned his birthright. And it was a way of getting back at his brother. But if the British government thought that the abdication of Edward and the succession of the much steadier George VI meant that the crisis was over, they were very wrong. Now in exile in France, Edward and Simpson set about courting Adolf Hitler in earnest. Yes, I mean, what happened was that after they abdicated, he left and the deal was that he would not get in the way of his brother. He would keep out of the way. He would not come back to Britain. So he went into exile in France and they had a very lavish villa in the south of France, now owned by uh, the oligarch Roman Abramovich and a huge townhouse in Paris. And they entertained very extensively. They had liveried servants. They were very, very extravagant and very ostentatious in the way they behaved. In October 1937, as Europe teetered on the brink of war, Edward and Simpson even visited Nazi Germany, where they were entertained by Hitler himself at his mountain retreat in Bavaria. But the scandal is not so much the abdication, it's what he did afterwards, which was to go and visit Hitler in Germany. There's a famous picture where Hitler is leaning over, kissing her hand. Where did he and Mrs. Simpson go? Nazi Germany, where they were received as, well, she was received as they wanted. Hitler's plan for the Duke and Duchess of Windsor was simple and would have been devastatingly effective. After conquering Britain, he would return Edward to the throne with Simpson as his queen and the Fuhrer running the show behind the scenes. The couple's vanity meant that they were happy to play along, despite the disastrous cost it would have inflicted on the British people. The rumor was that Hitler's plan was to invade England, the UK, and establish Edward VIII as like a puppet king. The Germans are very keen on when they thought they'd take England, they'd have him as a puppet ruler. There's little doubt, I think, that he would have accepted. Yes, well, this is the thing, because the closeness and proximity that Wallace had with the Reich, but also the enamoring sort of relationship that Hitler had with Edward VIII. It was this fantastic equation that would have allowed Hitler to get what he wanted by taking over England and installing the rightful king on the throne, which would have been Edward VIII, which would have been a puppet sort of uh, puppet master syndrome here. It, it would have been Hitler pulling the strings and Edward doing what he would have done to make his people feel that everything is okay. The king is here, he's our rightful king. Meanwhile, Hitler's calling the shots and I really think that Edward would have been okay with that. As well as enjoying Hitler's hospitality on their tour of Germany, Edward was pictured inspecting a squadron of SS guards and giving a full Nazi salute. He would have handed this country on a plate to Hitler. There wouldn't have been resistance. There wouldn't have been anything. Oh, I understand what Hitler's trying to do. I might not see all of the bad and evil that's behind that because he's packaged it up so eloquently with the way he speaks and the way he entertains and treats us that, yes, yes, we're friends. We'll all be fine. Uh, but that was Hitler's strategy. But Edward VIII wasn't a very smart man. He couldn't see through that thin veil. It turned out the irony of this whole story is that his brother, who then took over the crown, ended up being a much more effective king through the wartime than Edward VIII would have been. And it was a blessing in disguise. For as much as the country was plunged into crises with the crown, it was actually a very good thing that things turned out the way they did, because there wouldn't have been the fighting spirit under George VI that we have come to know and treasure. In 1939, following the invasion of Poland, Britain finally declared war on Germany, and after the invasion of France in spring 1940, the Duke and Duchess first fled to Spain and then Portugal.
The atrocities committed by the Nazis did nothing to dampen Edward's enthusiasm for their cause, however. During the occupation of Paris, he personally requested the German Wehrmacht place guards at his Paris and Riviera homes. Finally, Prime Minister Winston Churchill had had enough. He threatened the Duke with a court-martial if he did not return to Britain. Which, of course, left Churchill and Edward's brother George VI with another dilemma. What were they to do with the traitorous Duke? Thomas May Archer Mills and historian Jane Dismore explain. So this is why George VI said, look, you're now going to go to the Bahamas and you're going to be the governor general there and you'll do it until I say I'm done with you in that post. So there he is trying to be a good king, looking after the country and during time of war. And his brother is an unguided missile who the only way to, to keep him out of trouble is by sending him off to, to become governor of the Bahamas. I think it was Churchill's idea, and they sent him off there. And he hated it. He resented being told anything by not just the British government, but by his brother. Because in his mind, he was the rightful king. Yes, he abdicated, but not really on his own accord. He was forced to abdicate because he wasn't able to choose the woman that he loved. So it wasn't him, himself, in his mind, making the open choice to abdicate. He was forced to put his pen to that paper to abdicate against his will because no one would accept that he couldn't carry out the job, quote, without the woman he loves by his son. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor arrived in Nassau in August 1940 where they would see out the rest of the war, safe, presumably, from Hitler's influence. While Edward may have held the rather grand-sounding title of Governor of the Bahamas, the reality was he had been shunted off to the furthest possible part of the British Empire, as far from the war as possible. It was another insult to the man who was once king, with Edward even sneeringly referring to the islands as a third-class British colony. They did briefly have a role during the Second World War when he was sent as governor to the Bahamas. This was Churchill having threatened him with court martial, saying the only way we're going to basically keep you under tabs and away from Hitler, the only way to keep you out of mischief is to send you to the Bahamas. But even there, he proved to be troublesome and George VI is informed by MI6 of what he's getting up to. Edward may have been shipped 7,000 miles away from London, but the British weren't taking any chances. Hitler's plans to install him as puppet king were still a threat, and the activities of the Duke and Duchess were still closely monitored by intelligence services. Well, it's not just that either, because you need to, to take it a step further. And you need to look at the closeness and proximity of the Bahamas to the United States. So here you have the governor general, the governor of the Bahamas, and his wife, who were known Nazi sympathizers, who are now engaged in war with Great Britain and the United States. So there was a reason that Wallace and Edward are there, so the Americans can watch what's going on, the British can watch what's going on. They were sort of smushed, if you will, in between two of the Allied powers. So any of the cables, anything that was coming to a fro, could easily be tipped up by the Americans and tapped up by the British. So they, they were working together between the British and the American government. And the king is told every now and then by the security services what, of what conversations that have been overheard and the sort of people he's mixing with. There was a Swedish millionaire, for example, called Axel Brenner, who was known to have close ties with certain Nazis and the Duke of Windsor was told this, but did he stop his friendship with him? No, he didn't. He didn't. You know, I know what I'm doing. I, it's no problem. I go out on his yacht and we do this, that and the other. There, there is no inconsistency between that and my being the brother of the King of England. Perhaps astonishingly, rather than tone down their pro-Nazi views, or at least keep them quiet, Edward and Wallace Simpson continued to appear to actively work against the Allied war effort. They gave an interview to a newspaper, and this is the time when England has been trying hard to get America into the war as an ally. And we have 
the Princess Elizabeth's other uncle, we also David, David Bowes Lyon, so her mother's brother, he's working in Washington with agencies out there trying to persuade um, America and her allies to, uh, to join us. So he's doing the sort of the good work, if you like. On the other hand, you've got Duke of Windsor, her other uncle, and Wallace giving interviews to the American press saying, I'm just paraphrasing here, that America would be stupid. I think, I think Wallace Simpson's word was actually stupid to come into the war. It later emerged that Wallace Simpson had never really broken it off with the Nazi von Ribbentrop. It was alleged that she continued to leak secrets to help him throughout the war. After the defeat of Nazi Germany and the victory in Japan, the Duke and Duchess returned to Europe and their luxury villa in the south of France. But still, his former title meant that Edward continued to be considered a threat to the firm. This is why the British government spent all of the money they did with an OK from King George VI to wire and tap and listen to all of the goings-ons of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor well after the war was even over. This is how fearful the king, George VI, was and distrusting of his brother, as well as the British government, that they had to tap and listen and wire and spy on the Duke and Duchess of Windsor because they were not trusted. Still, Edward persisted in his treachery. In the 1950s, a journalist reported hearing Edward blame the war on, and I quote, Roosevelt and the Jews. And as late as 1974, the Duke's former friend, Patrick Balfour, wrote that Edward had told him, and again I quote, I never thought that Hitler was such a bad chap. I think once more information came out as to the atrocities that were being carried out by Hitler and the Reich, it was not fashionable anymore to be seen to be in those circles. But once you're in those circles, you're in them. And Wallace and Edward had friends in those circles. Do you stop being friends with these people? What exactly was the extent of their network? And this is why the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were continually being the conduit, if you will, for the government to want to know what they know. What are they believing? Who are they talking to? Whom else is involved in this circle with them? Because if you're a sympathizer, that sympathy can last even if it's not fashionable. It goes underground. So this, this was a very big concern of the British government because it would not look good for the crown or the government have you a king's brother out there still sympathizing with Edward and Wallace Simpson may have still been the subject of monitoring by the British Secret Services, but as his former kingdom spent the decades after the war rebuilding itself, by contrast, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor seem to be content to live out the rest of their lives in a haze of parties and indolence in the south of France. And then it looks at the sort of empty, wandering life they had in Cathy society, up to financial shenanigans, treating their staff abominably and really uh, having no purpose in life except playing golf, gardening and, and looking at their investments and entertaining some pretty dubious characters. He had to create his own work and this was a problem. He had nothing to do. So you could say that they were socialites, but the life was very, very empty in many ways for them. And of course they were who they were and they had to live it or lived in a certain style. But I think he must have found it very, very empty very often. This empty life was to take its toll on their relationship. The great love story of the century, it seems, was anything but. Not only was he having an affair with someone else when he was meant to be with Wallace, but so was Wallace. So they were not even particularly monogamous with each other before they got married. Edward would oftentimes retire from her company and go to his study and look at all the things that he used to have when he was king and pictures that reminded him of his former life. And I do think at times that he did regret the decisions that he did make to stay on with Wallace because it did cost him his life. It cost him his kingship. And I think that he wasn't ever really fully able to reconcile himself fully 
I think he was young and not so much in love, but in lust. And when you're younger and don't understand things as you should, you make rash decisions that actually affect your later life. She had a series of affairs, including with a gay man called uh, Jimmy Donoghue, who was the heir to the Woolworth fortune and the cousin of Barbara Hutton. But she had affairs with, with other people as well, probably with an actress called Russell Knight. We know this from the Secret Service reports that were conducted. Not only did the British bug them, but the FBI and also the French. Many of these affairs seem to be conducted with the other's full knowledge. And, it has been alleged, the couple would sometimes even share lovers. Well, I think the, the extraordinary thing was to discover that they were bisexual, both Wallace and the Duke. He had an affair with Walter Chrysler, the son of the, the founder of Chrysler, and possibly with an actor called Clifton Webb. But we know also from Scotty Bowers' revelations that they would go to Hollywood and Scotty Bowers would, who was of course a procurer of sexual things for Hollywood, would also bring them young boys and girls for their pleasure there. By the end, it was doubtful whether they even liked each other that much. She's on record, even before they got married, that she found him boring and didn't want to be left alone with him. But she felt that he was besotted by her, even though, you know, she would often send him to bed in tears and would say, buzz off, mosquito. He was besotted with her. I think he realised that she had made huge sacrifices for him, and that made him feel bad. She clearly felt that she had thrown away her life for this man, that she was only really playing with as, as a lover. He was in a situation that he couldn't leave from at all because were he to divorce Wallace, they would have shown him completely for the absolute idiot that he was. And it really would have made him just not look good in any case. What was it all for? If it was the love story of the century, you should have stayed with her. Why would you divorce her? It costs you your country, you betray everyone, and now you're no longer with the woman who you gave everyone up for. So, yeah, it, it would have made him look like a complete topper. And I, I think he just lived out his days until he died of, of his cancer, and that was that. On May 28th, 1972, the man who was once King Edward VIII died at his home in Paris. He was 78 years old. His body was returned to Britain and buried in the Royal Burial Ground at Frogmore by Windsor Castle. And it was the only time that she was actually allowed to go back to the United Kingdom was for his funeral, the Duke of Windsor's funeral. And she was treated very coldly. The Queen Mother didn't really ever have much to say to her at all. They, they were not friends at all. Uh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, of course, she was invited, but she, she didn't let Wallace stay with the family. Uh, Wallace stayed apart from everyone else. The funeral was held at Windsor, the family stayed at Windsor, but Wallace stayed at the palace, and she was transported where she needed to be. With Edward gone, the firm, now with Queen Elizabeth II on the throne, swung into action to do what it has always done. First and foremost, to protect the royal brand. I think certainly what happened at the funeral was that she was targeted by Prince Philip and by his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, to basically they persuaded her over the funeral lunch to return all sorts of royal memorabilia, uh, garter robes, uh, documents, anything maybe possibly embarrassing in connection with the German cousins. And the librarian of the Royal Archives actually made three trips shortly after his death to recover this material, take it to the Royal Archives, where it sits, presumably to this day, in isolated splendor with no one looking at it. When it was all said and done, they packaged Wallace up and they sent him back to France. Wallace Simpson was to live for another 14 years, many of them suffering from dementia, before she too passed away in April 1986. She was not given a state funeral, although the royal family did consent to have her buried beside her husband at Frogmore. So, even now, the royal family is in death, still not united. They are on the outskirts of, of the cemetery at Frogmore. They're not in a royal mausoleum, they're not anywhere. They, they are out of the outer wall at the royal burial ground. So even in death, they still continue to be treated as the outcasts and the untrusting members of the family that they were. 
For years, the tale of Edward and Mrs. Simpson had been held up as one of the great romances of the 20th century. The man so captivated by the American beauty, he sacrificed the crown for love. And perhaps that's how the firm would like us to see it. With the role of the villain naturally going to the twice-divorced, sexually deviant foreigner who had seduced Edward away from the throne. And yes, people want to blame her for his downfall. But as a historian, we are responsible for our own actions. And I do not see her as his downfall. I see him and his inability to grow up and be a proper man, which actually led to his own downfall. Thomas Mace Archer Mills does not see history that way, however. Edward VIII was not a romantic hero. He was spoiled. He was a petulant person, and he was about self-gratification. He could care less about the empire. He could care less about the crown. All he cared about was his celebrity lifestyle, not really having to work for it and being given everything he wanted. He wasn't about duty. He wasn't about what's in the best interest of his people. He was about what's in the best interest of himself. And he thought that was Wallace. And for Richard Fitzwilliams, he was a traitor. Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson certainly had right-wing friends and right-wing sympathies. This wasn't unusual amongst the British upper classes in the 1930s. But I have to say that Edward, in, in my view, had a particular affection for Hitler. And we know it didn't turn out very well for him at all, because he did damage the brand. He almost cost the United Kingdom its crown. Next time on The Firm, Blood Lies and Royal Succession. And when she was given that property on Mystique, the island of the Caribbean, which is a private island where uber wealthy Brits and, and foreign nationals have their holiday home, she made it her own little fiefdom. She was the queen of Mystique. And I believe that there were parties of licentiousness, you know, where people drank a lot and possibly imbibed in the occasional uh, marijuana or whatever was going on. And in other words, these people who live their lives in constant propriety were able to suddenly be whatever they wanted to be. And Margot could tell wonderful stories and uh, could dance the light fandangos as the best of us. The Firm, Blood Lies and Royal Succession is a production of Audology, a division of Empire Media Group. The series is hosted by me, Jonathan Locke. Executive producers are Dylan Howard and Melissa Cronin. The series is written by Dominic Utton, reporting by Douglas Montero, mixing and sound design by Sean Kravitz. Please subscribe to The Firm wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating, review, and tell your friends.